My name is Zoe Siegel, and I am the Director of Climate Resilience at Greenbelt Alliance. We are so excited to introduce you to the Resilience Playbook today and offer you a first look into what we hope will be a useful and powerful tool for all of you. In case this is your first time joining, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of Greenbelt Alliance. We are a Bay Area nonprofit uh, that works across the San Francisco Bay Area, and our mission is to educate, advocate, and collaborate to make the Bay Area's lands and communities more resilient to a changing climate. At Greenbelt Alliance, we envision a Bay Area of healthy, thriving, resilient communities made of lands and people that are safer during climate disasters and recover quickly from wildfire, floods, and drought. A place where everyone is living with nature in new and powerful ways for generations to come. This understanding of resilience is influenced in part by our legacy of advocating for the protection of the Bay Area's natural and working lands during our 60 year history. We know that with the appropriate policies, like the ones we highlight in the Resilience Playbook, the Bay Area can address the housing crisis while protecting our unique natural ecosystems that ensure our most vulnerable communities can respond to the climate crisis. Today, I will share a bit more information about the Resilience Playbook and the many ways that it can be used. We'll start with some introductions and acknowledgements, and then I'll share a bit about how the playbook came about and walk you through how to navigate it. I will then pass it off to other speakers joining me today to talk about how the playbook can be used in action. We will have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. As we go along, please put any questions in the chat. And uh, if you have any comments during the presentation, feel free to use the chat fe feature. The Resilience Playbook exists today as a result of our significant work of everyone on our team and our project donors and partners from Save the Bay in Richmond land. I'm joined today by three colleagues and friends that I'm very excited to both introduce and partner with on this endeavor. Berna Idris, Greenbelt Alliance's Climate and Equity Associate, Allison Chan, the Political Director for Save the Bay, and Dulce Galicia, the Director of Placemaking at Richmond land. They will introduce themselves and share a bit more about their work shortly. But as they say, it takes a village. We additionally would like to acknowledge our partners and funders who make this work possible. Save the Bay and Richmond Land have been great project partners and we look forward to working with them and many of you to implement these policies listed in the playbook and to make our region more resilient. I would also like to thank the Gerbodi Foundation, the Lisa and Douglas Goldwyn Fund, the pg e Corporation Foundation, Diane Wisely and Arthur and Tony Rembry Rock for supporting the creation and implementation of the Resilience Playbook. And finally, Twitter for su providing support for this launch. We are extremely grateful for our entire donor community across the Bay Area because without them, this project would not have been possible. Thank you. Speaking of support, this has been a full team effort. Beyond those of us on this webinar, many other people across our organizations have con contributed to the playbook over the last year, and I want to take a moment to acknowledge all of their incredible work. I also want to thank the experts from around the region and the state working in equitable climate resilience in some way who reviewed all or parts of the playbook. We worked very hard to make sure that the playbook is as accurate as possible, but they helped add tremendous value, draw connections, and suggest policies we had not yet considered. Before we dive in, I would also like to acknowledge the lands belonging to the many different indigenous communities throughout the Bay Area. We stand on the unceded territories of the Ohlone people and want to take time to recognize the historic discrimination and violence inflicted upon indigenous communities, including their forced removal from their ancestral lands and the deliberate and systematic ethnic cleansing of their communities and culture, which continues to this day through displacement, gentrification, and racism. Greenbelt Alliance is committed to taking action in order to foster a culture that acknowledges these harms, shows empathy and care, and demonstrates positive steps towards reconciliation and repair, while creating space to uplift indigenous traditional ecological knowledge and grassroots movement. This land acknowledgement is just a starting point. Our organization supports campaigns like the one to protect Eurostack, the sacred lands of the Amamutsun tribe, tribal band near Gilroy, that is under threat of being turned into a sand and gravel, gravel mine. This is just one of hundreds of indigenous led grassroots campaigns that you can support in the Bay Area. You can learn more about which land you occupy by going to the link in the chat and seeing how you can pay a land tax 
or get involved in a, uh, in a campaign. So there should be a link that will be dropped in the chat shortly about that. And one more thing before we dive in, we wanna know more about who's here. The playbook is designed for a wide range of audiences and we're very excited to learn who's here committed taking, who, who here is today is committed to taking action with us. Uh, there should be a, a poll that's about to be launched. And if you could fill that out in a moment, that would be great. And if you haven't already done so, if you could take a moment to add your location that you're zooming into to the chat, that would be wonderful. Uh, yes, I believe everyone can see the poll. And then Daniela, whenever you feel like enough people have uh, filled out the poll, you can close it and we can check out the answers. I feel like that might be a, a good amount of time. All right, it looks like a little bit more nonprofit organizations, but a large number of government and government uh, affiliated people as well. A lot of people located all around the Bay Area, which is great because we represent or we, you know, we work all around the Bay Area and a few people outside of California or elsewhere in California. And I think everybody, uh, you know, believes that knows that it's important to, you know, plan for risks and address our, you know, equitable advocacy and planning, open space preservation, and uh, include climate resilient housing. So thank you very much. Okay, so we all know that California is on the front line of the climate crisis and the housing crisis. Residents around our region are facing significant economic, social, and health challenges as a result. Climate hazards are hitting some communities much harder than others. These impacts, along with our deeply embedded history of exclusionary zoning and growing income inequality, means that people of color and those with fewer resources often bear the brunt of the climate crisis. We recognize that our region has an immense opportunity to take a holistic approach to advancing solutions that address the overlapping environmental, economic, and social challenges simultaneously. So what do we do? We need a holistic approach to solving these issues while centering people in our land use decisions on how we use and protect our lands and where we grow our communities. We're fortunate to live in a region with a strong level of environmental awareness and proud to have so many residents and activists passionately dedicating their time to fighting climate change and protecting our communities. And there are so many people on this call that we have worked with over the last few years. And we are so excited that you are here and that you are learning more, that you're about to learn more about this tool and we really look forward to, uh, to advocating with you in the future. But at the same time, local governments and local climate activists can really feel overwhelmed and frustrated by decisions being made and the pace that we're moving at and really not know how to make these tangible policy changes. Fortunately, there's significant meaningful action that we can take at the local level and Green Belt Alliance has pinpointed how to do so. We can be more resilient to a changing climate, reduce our climate impact, and be more equitable and inclusive. We can do this by making sure the policies in our local cities and counties reduce greenhouse gas emissions and build healthy, safe, climate resilient communities. Some of you may have already heard me mention this, but I was recently listening to a podcast by Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson, and someone asked, what is the number one action that they can take to reduce their climate impact? I don't wanna spoil the podcast for you because she's amazing, but things like recycling or bringing your own straw are not going to make the impact that we need to reduce the warming of the planet and prepare our communities for the next big climate hazard. The number one thing we can do is get involved in local planning processes and make sure that our elected officials care about the right issues and city staff have the support that they need to enact these policies. That sounds simple, right? But how do we do that? 
with the Resilience Playbook. Throughout our advocacy work over the last few years, and based on countless interviews with elected officials and partners, we have identified a need to support these complex relationships in a way that is accessible to all and offers tangible steps for what to do about all of this. That's why we've created a comprehensive tool like the Resilience Playbook to bring the public, policy practitioners, planners, and other stakeholders together to establish a common understanding of the climate challenges and opportunities that our region faces. So you may be thinking, okay, that's great, but what is the Resilience Playbook? What am I doing here? The Playbook brings together a collection of curated strategies, resources, and toolkits from around the region to support local decision makers and community leaders as they look to accelerate the region's adaptation to climate risks. This includes policy and planning recommendations, practical template language, and innovative example ordinances that you can use to accelerate climate action on multiple climate risks. To articulate this vision, we worked with artist Alfred Twu to illustrate how our vision would come to life if we enacted these policies that, that leverage natural and working lands as nature-based infrastructure and absorb floodwaters, sequester carbon, protect water supply, and provide bufflers from wildfires. And you can see this depicted in the image on the screen. In tandem, we also address the critical issue of advancing housing justice, planning for a just transition away from fossil fuels towards green jobs, and pursuing environmental justice to ensure that the outcomes of these policies prioritize the resilience of the most vulnerable communities. The playbook is divided into the five following action areas, and I'm going to run through them quickly and share one recommendation from each chapter to show as an example, but you'll have to read the rest of the playbook to fully understand, or to, to, to fully learn about all the other recommendations. So in order to make our communities more resilient, we need to enact bolder policies that center community members who are most impacted by the climate and housing crisis, our low income and communities of color. Most of our work is centered around providing a more equitable, just future for the most vulnerable populations. And in order to do this, we must make sure that everyone has a seat at the table, provide more affordable homes, incorporate nature-based solutions, and accelerate a just transition away from fossil fuels. So our, our entire first chapter focuses on centering people and equity in the planning process. As many of you are aware, we are already beginning to see how sea level rise and drought will pose a serious threat to our homes, livelihoods, and industries located along the shoreline and along our watershed corridors. If any, anyone went for a walk along the shoreline during uh, the King Tide, King Tide this past weekend, you can see that we're already beginning to experience the impacts of, of sea level rise and, and flooding in the Bay Area. And it's, it's crucial that we address this complex interconnected overlay of these risks on our region across multiple sectors. Our chapter on protecting communities from floods and droughts includes policies to make these connections. We've seen Many more wildfires burning, larger areas burned, and an increased frequency of high severity fires causing more damage to structures and lives lost. We need to enact policies that require the conservation of undeveloped land in high fire risk areas to create defensible space and natural wildfire buffers and to preserve the rich biodiversity in wildfire prone areas. The playbook details ways we can coexist with wildfire through our land use decision making. When we don't create enough homes of, for people of all income levels, prices go up and working class and low income families can't afford to live in the communities that they've resided in for generations. This is why it's critical to support growth in safe infill locations. That is the focus of our housing chapter, which offers what is needed to equitably address the Bay Area's housing crisis. We also need to support the role of natural and working lands in providing nature-based climate resilience to people and ecosystems while contributing to public health and safety, providing critical habitat connectivity, offering park and recreation opportunities, and yielding carbon sequestration benefits. This is an often overlooked yet extremely powerful tool for our region. So we have an entire chapter detailing how to harness the power of nature for resilience. Okay, so you've heard a bit about, the play, about what's in the playbook. Now you're probably thinking, that sounds great, but can I see what it looks like? Yeah, okay, let's take a look. So I'm going to walk you through it, but you can also go to resilienceplaybook.org and see it yourself. Let's see. Okay, there we go. 
So this is the landing page that you'll come to on the Resilience Playbook website. And it's a separate website from uh, the Greenbelt page because it is a, um, you know, so many other organizations have worked on it. We wanted it to be this, this standalone resource. Um, so looking at the navigation, we have, you know, an introduction, some information about how to navigate the playbook, um, some some information about how to really implement climate policies, making sure they're you know measurable and implementable, dealing with you know governance challenges and things like that. Um, and then we have the five action areas down here. So let's just click on the protecting floods and communities from drought as an example. Each section like this section provides a background of the topic at hand and it discusses some of the most pressing risks we face. So you scroll down here and you can see kind of the description and then we get into what's at risk and then some critical actions to take now. This is the one that was listed on the site, but then we have on, on the, the webinar, but then we have a number of other critical actions. And in the sea level rise page, we also talk about subsidence, rising groundwater and drought. And then down at the bottom, you can see the policy matrix. And these policies were mostly sourced from ambitious climate action plans and general plans from around the region. But we also used white papers and scientific articles to gather a scope of best practices that thoroughly address the risks we outlined. And so each, um, the policy matrix has, you know, a goal, a strategy, an action. And then you can click on the source um, to see, you know, which general plan or climate action plan that it came from. And then if you want to see all of the policy matrix uh, policies, you can click the policy matrix up top. Um, and, you know, speaking of, you know, working collaboratively, we know that we're not the only agency or organization, you know, working on these issues. And we would be remiss to not mention some of the incredible work of our partners. And during the creation of the playbook, we worked closely with our partners at BCDC, MTC, and Enterprise Community Partners. And in a similar vein, we've also collaborated with the Regional Coalition of Housing Advocates on a related toolkit about affordable housing and equity. I think all we, I think people from all of these entities are on this call right now, um, and we want to really highlight all of the incredible resources and in the creation of the playbook, really acknowledge that, you know, we're not reinventing the wheel. We're really, this is a, a place to bring everything together. So on the toolkit page, there is a whole source, a whole host of other uh, resources from around the region. And so, you know, eventually the playbook might be a printed document, but in, in the Zoom world that we live in right now, we thought this would be most useful as a, you know, iterative, uh, living, breathing website. And as a result, there's no one way to use the playbook. Um, we, you know, you can kind of uh, click on, you know, whichever site makes the most sense for you, you know, maybe if you're very well versed in the, um, you know, in the topic, you just click straight to the policy matrix, or maybe you want to learn, you know, a little bit more about um, the issues before you, you dive into the policies. It's sort of like a, you know, a choose your own adventure, you can, you know, the users can have whatever journey they would like. And the powerful experience of the playbook is that you really can craft your own journey. And with that, I will see if I can restart this presentation and pass it off to my colleague, Berna. Oh, look, I did it. <laughs> awesome, thank you so much, Zoe. Hey everybody, it's such a pleasure to have you here. My name is Berna Idris. For those of you who may not know me, I'm Greenbelt Alliance's Climate and Equity Associate. And you know, while we were creating this amazing tool called the Playbook, we knew that it would be the most effective if it brought together a diverse audience into the shared understanding of resilience. And uh, there are many people across our, our region from activists to elected officials, city staff, and everyone in between who feel the impacts of climate change and want to support their communities on the path towards climate resilience. But oftentimes they might lack the technical policy knowledge or the subject area expertise. You know, we aren't all walking encyclopedias, even though we wish we were. And the Resilience Playbook is geared towards these this distinct audiences. 
Uh, we want to engage community members and community-based organizations, city and county staff, and elected officials. And because each of these groups would use the playbook differently, we have designed this resource to be accessible in a variety of ways. So let us show you the power of this document through these three different channels. All right, so we have our wonderful partners, Dulce Galicia, Director of Placemaking at Richmond Land, and Allison Chan, Political Director of Save the Bay, to illustrate to you how the playbook can support the goals of specific audiences and share some illuminating case studies that inform the design of this project. So first, we'll start off with Dulce, who will tell you the story of what meeting community needs can look like. Thank you, Verna. I appreciate it. I'm so glad to be in this space. My name is Dulce Galicia. I'm the Director of Placemaking, and I come to this space as an ardent community organizer, and I also hold a master's in public policy. Placemaking is about land use and the housing element and how we can think critically about how we create and keep our places as home as a community. So, um, we are an emerging community land trust. Um, we are also a housing developer and we take land out of the speculative market um, in order to make it perpetually affordable. We cannot have a community land trust without the community. Um, and our focus area is Richmond and unincorporated West Contra Costa County. Um, you can go on to the next slide. As I mentioned, mentioned, we are an emerging CLT developer um, and we want to build grassroots power with community in order to continue to have con community controlled land use. Um, one of the ways that we've started to do this work was in 2019, uh, we had a, a group of fellows. Uh, these fellows are community members they came together and they developed the idea to have more affordable housing for the community. What they came through through their uh, substantial research, they decided that having an eco village in unincorporated Contra Costa County was greatly going to benefit the community. We also saw that the zoning in the area did not fit the community dreams. We were looking at the subdivisions, at creek frontage. We were looking at all of this through a just transition framework. Um, and the climate commitments that were in the general plan did not resonate with the community values. So we looked towards the general plan to make the changes that we needed and that were required early on for the development projects that we were looking at. We weren't solely saying we want to build 200 units of housing. We were saying we want to build housing that is accord that that really is in alignment with what community wants and that is in alignment with the future climate resilience so we convened about 20 to 30 community we talked about the environmental justice goals policies and actions through uh, through the general plan we come through large documents with people i mean pages and pages of, of documents um Sorry, seems like there's audio feedback. Um, hopefully this is this is better. Um, so I'll take a couple of steps back. Um, so we look towards the general plan to make the changes that we needed and that we required or that were required early on. Uh, we convened about 20 to 30 residents. Um, this was in early early 2021, so early this year. Uh, we combed through large documents with community members and through their participation, they started to really say, hey, these aren't the things that resonate with us. So we created a summary of new recommendations not included in the environmental justice goals, policies and actions. And we co-created with residents line by line edits to the EJ goals, policies and actions within the Contra Costa general plan. We realized that this was a lengthy process, learning the language, the levers and knowing how to clearly put forward recommendations with community was key. 
the playbook incorporates a lot of our learnings with the community as Richmond land. It wasn't easy. It was not an easy task. And there were three main takeaways, um, or there are three main ways that members of the public, community-based organizations, and other people can utilize this playbook based on, on what we learned through this very lengthy process. Um, number one, is breaking down complicated technical language. The play, playbook goes into a multitude of climate risks in a succinct way that seeks to provide a baseline information about flooding, sea level rise, wildfires, in a way that isn't overly jargony. Um, you can use it to teach yourself and your community about particular climate risks. The second one is the playbook also provides policy recommendations that you can organize your community around to make sure that local plans take climate hazards into consideration. And some of the policy recommendations, recommendations that we made with community will also be included in this playbook. Lastly, the playbook breaks down different governance structures that might influence your town or city and you can learn more about how governance of climate change in the region um, can, can really be helpful to leverage. And so that was really important and critical for us was to understand um, who we could move, who we could work with. Um, lastly, I just want to add that this playbook matters and it matters for the work that we do. One, having a, a roadmap is key. The research and strategy is really important. It is key, especially as you're speaking with community. Um, sometimes as, as an organizer, as someone working with community, you need to have clarity on where you're going and how you're doing it. And so the playbook really lays that out. Um, also, organizing never stops and the work with people never stops along the way. Uh, we befriended planners. Uh, we befriended people in, in different departments in order to, to be able to think about climate resiliency. From city, county perspective, it can seem really hard. Um, but the way that we did it in, in Contra Costa County was we started to hold monthly meetings with our, with our county planners to really tell them, hey, this is what, what the community wants. And, and so it became an ongoing conversation outside of the regular um, general plan conversations. The other thing that I thought was really amazing and why this playbook matters is that our architects were also really um, thoughtful about how we were creating community change or the recommendations that we wanted to bring forward. And so it wasn't just, you know, okay, let's think about the layout of of, of the design that you want to do in the community. And it was really about bringing in people to understand how do we do community-led development that continues to work within the community as a whole. So it isn't just, it stops with the general plan, it stops with the planning, but it is a continuation of the work that the community is doing. Um, and thank you so much. I, I really hope that you all find the playbook as useful um, as when we started this road. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much, Dulce, for the work that you and Richmond Land do uplifting the community. It's super important. And that was an amazing example. Now I'll invite Allison to join uh, with us to explain how the playbook can be used by decision makers to empower political action around climate resilience. Thank you, Verna. So my name is Allison Chan, and I'm the political director at Save the Bay, and very happy to uh, be a part of introducing the playbook to the world today. Um, so as Verna mentioned, I'm going to go over uh, some points about how the playbook offers an opportunity for elected officials to take action um, and highlight some of the ways specifically that Save the Bay is utilizing uh, the guidance set forth in this document. Um, but let me set the stage for a moment. There's a consensus that I think we're all aware of among elected officials across our region that action is needed to protect communities from uh, communities and wildlife from sea level rise and other climate impacts. 
We need to protect shoreline habitat, which provides critical refuge for many threatened and endangered species. We need to protect roads, schools, homes, and businesses from rising bay waters. Uh, we need to reduce heat islands and create green spaces that can absorb rainwater. But for a region with such vast wealth and political power, we are moving at an alarmingly slow pace at implementing actual solutions on the ground. Luckily, we now have a resource that can help turn this ship quickly. The Resilience Playbook provides a comprehensive set of concrete policies and best practices for advancing climate resilience in the Bay Area within local planning processes, including, which has been mentioned, general plan updates, climate action plan updates, city priority setting and budgeting processes, and other land use and infrastructure planning. Elected leaders can learn about and select strategies from the playbook that address their community's unique climate and equity challenges. And since the playbook is also designed to assist agency staff and community members in crafting local strategies, this tool allows elected and, uh, and staff and community members to all work from the same resource, which is very valuable in advancing uh, conversations quickly. So I'd like to highlight some of the actions and strategies featured in the playbook that Save the Bay is particularly focused on implementing throughout the region. So one of Save the Bay's top priorities is to advance local and regional solutions that protect communities from sea level rise. As noted in the playbook, a four foot increase in total water level places an astounding 355,000 homes and $46 billion in economic assets at risk. We need solutions to protect our families, businesses, roads, sewage treatment plants, and other critical infrastructure that are within the flood zone. Our local and regional leadership should act now to prepare our communities for sea level rise and avoid these horrible losses. So we can protect developed areas by implementing nature-based adaptation including marsh restoration, horizontal or living levees. We should accommodate sea level rise by ensuring that buildings are designed to withstand flooding. We can do that by reforming our building standards to establish minimum first floor elevations, implement shoreline and creek buffer zones, require uh, uh, on-site uh, stormwater capture uh, processes to avoid localized flooding and require levee improvements to be combined with developments that are directly adjacent to the shoreline. Wherever possible, we should avoid areas at risk uh, of flooding by concentrating new development away from the flood zone and instead focusing development in transit rich areas, which also facilitates access to jobs and critical services. The Resilience Playbook emphasizes all of these strategies and provides a wide range of policy examples to aid in implementation. Next slide, please. We can also harness the power of nature to protect communities and infrastructure away from the shoreline uh, from climate impacts. Urban greening is a multi-benefit approach that reduces flooding from storms and heat islands in our communities. It also supports pedestrians and cyclists, uh, which links up with a lot of our community's climate mitigation strategies. And greening protects water quality in our creeks in the Bay. Luckily, elected officials need not look far for the guidance they need to implement equitable urban greening projects in their communities. The playbook provides extensive policy guidance for integrating urban greening as a priority within local agency operations and planning processes. I'll highlight some examples. So first and foremost, we must focus greening, we must focus greening projects in underinvested communities. Save the Bay is currently advocating for a citywide urban greening policy in San Jose with a strong focus on enabling projects in East San Jose, which suffers from extreme heat and has experienced devastating floods in the recent past. The playbook offers a lot of insight and examples for uh, approaching urban greening projects in vulnerable communities. Secondly, general plans and climate action plans should explicitly incorporate urban greening to ensure that implementation is integrated into land use planning and sustainability initiatives instead of greening becoming 
uh, a, a second thought or an add-on at the end of a project or at the end of a planning process. The playbook emphasizes ways to do this in an integrated fashion. Greening should also be advanced through city ordinances. For example, Redwood City piloted an ordinance requiring develop developers to build and maintain urban greening projects along the adjacent public right-of-way to their development, which includes primarily sidewalks and roads. This reduces the burden on our cities and provides an opportunity for collaboration with the development community to build climate resilient communities that include and incorporate urban green space into both private and public spaces. Sea level rise and urban greening are only two examples of the many resources included in the Resilience Playbook, making it an invaluable tool for decision makers throughout the region to move beyond discussion and toward action and implementation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Allison, for that example and those case studies, which some of them you can find in the playbook. And now I would like to talk to you about how city and county staff can utilize the playbook. You know, we know that incorporating climate policies like the ones listed in the playbook and local planning policy processes is, is a critical step to building a resilient Bay Area. However, these policies are only the first step. Local jurisdictions must address their capacity, uh, political will, and governance issues in order to effectively implement these critical climate policies. The playbook has guidance for city staff to break down silos, bring departments together, and streamline climate resilience projects. We also provide recommendations for meaningful community engagement so that city and county staff can design workshops and projects that capture the needs of diverse communities and bring frontline voices to the table. So let's look at an example from the playbook. I wanna highlight a governance model that appears as a case study, the one shoreline approach in San Mateo County. We've included case studies such as this one to illustrate how a shared governance model can be used to address a complex climate hazard. These case studies can act as models for city and county staff looking to design cross-departmental and cross-jurisdictional solutions. In this case study, for example, the existing flood control district was altered to create the San Mateo County Flood and Sea Level Rise Resilience District in 2020. This new agency is able to streamline shoreline adaptation projects and facilitate collaboration across cities, regulatory agencies, and other public and private stakeholders. And you can see the different stakeholders in the graphic. And this district is currently one of a kind and demonstrates how these new tools can be used to facilitate collaboration, streamline projects, and generate stable funding, which is super important to continue our long-term resilience. You know, we believe that every county should have a shared governance model like San Mateo County, and Greenbelt Alliance is working with county staff around the region to lay groundwork for similar models to be implemented. I know there's some folks from Contra Costa County on the call today, so we really want to give a shout out because we've been actively advocating for increased capacity through, addi through additional funding, and we're proud to announce that the Contra Costa County Board of Supervisors recently approved funding for climate resilience and sustainability, and we're hoping that with this additional funding, though, they will be well on their way to creating a unified shoreline model. You know, this is a big step forward, so we'd really like to applaud the Contra Costa County staff, and for other examples like this, you can check out the playbook for case studies. Next slide, please. All right. So now you've been able to learn a little bit more about the playbook and our vision and what the playbook can do to make an equitable and resilient Bay Area. And we wanna invite you to join us in this journey. So we call upon you today in solidarity. Let's make our homes safe and prosperous for generations to come. I want to introduce now our commitment for a resilient Bay Area. If you at all resonated with the goals of our resilience playbook that we outlined today, please join community leaders such as Mayor Jesse Areguin, City of Berkeley, Mayor Libby Schaff, City of Oakland, Council Member Deborah Fudge, City of Windsor, Council Member Dan Kalb, City of Oakland, and Council Member Suzanne Hollingsworth Adams, City of Ronert Park. And we'd like to invite you to add your name to our commitment today. 
So the commitment will be uh, in the chat. And what we're trying to do with the commitment for Resilient Bay Area is to build collaboration and engagement around our playbook goals by holding elected officials, institutions, communities, and ourselves accountable for immediate and effective action to mitigate climate change and increase our community's resilience. You know, I know that the climate challenges ahead are really daunting, but there's a bright path forward if we all work together to actualize the shared vision. And we're already working with many of you on the call. So again, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time and the opportunity that you've given us today for us to articulate this vision. And now if you would take a moment, I think the commitment is live in the chat. You should be able to open an action network petition and we'll take a few minutes. You know, please join us in this vision and sign your name onto our commitment. Okay, and let us know if you had any technical difficulties, someone on our staff can help us, help you, excuse me, in the chat. All right, we finally got to the end and we know that creating this resource is actually not the end, it's just the start of our journey. And we're excited to share the beginning of this playbook journey with you. We believe that over the upcoming year, there's going to be a lot of work to do. We personally will be hosting a series of webinars that dive deeper into specific topic areas, like the role of green belts in wildfire, for example, or the environmental case for housing and the need for new resilience models, as well as some location specific workshops around currently updating general plans, housing elements and climate action plans. 2022 is a big year for action, especially with the state mandate mandated general housing plan element updates that we're hoping to work with with some of you that will give our region the opportunity to address climate change and the housing crisis in tandem. So if you're interested in learning more, please contact us. We'll put our contact in the chat. We want to show your organization or agency how you can utilize this resource. And we'd love to set up a time to present or discuss with your team. And the cool thing about this being a website is we know that the best practices, data, and science are constantly evolving. And we chose this website format so we could have timely content updates and incorporate some new and original research as it comes out. So once you've explored the Resilience Playbook, feel free to provide us with feedback about future topics and content that you think are important and critical to our region. And, you know, when you're reading it, any thoughts that you have, would love to hear about it. Our contact is in the chat. Any and all <laughs> questions, concerns are welcome. And, you know, before I continue, I want to leave you with these final words. In this region, we've come together at challenging times before, leading the nation in innovations and change from environmental protections to incredible technology. And I think together with the Resilience Playbook in hand, we can harness this passion and ingenuity to create a Bay Area that prioritizes environmental justice, uplifts nature-based solutions, and shows the rest of the state and nation that housing solutions are climate solutions. Thank you for your time and your patience. We can now move on to the Q&A and have a nice discussion. All right. Thank you, Berna, Allison, and Dulce. That was great. So now, yes, we'll turn to we'll turn and answer some of the questions that have been provided in the chat. If anyone else has any additional questions or is having trouble uh, signing the uh, the commitment, please feel free to put it in the chat or or ask us. Um, so to answer Marty's question, um, you know this because this is a website. Um, Yes, it's definitely, you know, actually this answers Susan and Marty's question. It's definitely, you know, an iterative, um, you know, an, an iterative resource. And so we're hoping to continuously add um, chapters around, um, you know, other water, potentially air quality, um, and hopefully, um, you know, uh, more, more bold topics, you know, diving deeper into, um, you know, managed retreat or transfer development rights, for instance, and in, kind of in, in the future. Um, and we're also uh, hoping to add more of a section on you know, funding and financing. Um, and 
Yes, policies and case studies can definitely be added. So if anybody um, on this call, you know, has suggestions um, uh, for, you know, what other, you know, policies or uh, case studies that can be added, um, definitely feel free to reach out to us. We would love to, to collaborate with you on this. And that was one of the biggest reasons when thinking about you know how to shape this document is why you know that's why we made it made it a website and not like a, a printed pdf so that we can you know continuously iterate uh to incorporate the latest uh science and uh model policies from around the region um okay so i let's see so uh klaus it asked, can you give one example where assisted relocation is being considered for the Bay Area? I know there's a number of cities that have, you know, thought about this. I can't, um, you know, officially, you know, I don't think I can think of a specific place that's, you know, thoroughly considering it, um, if anybody, but there's so many uh, other, you know, knowledgeable people on this call. If anybody has a, rep has a recommendation for a city, um, please uh, put that in the chat because we would love to learn more about that. Um, and then, yeah, and Ezra asked, you know, can you tell us more about the Contra Costa One Shoreline idea? Um, yeah, so right now, you know, it's not a, you know, fully built out uh, concept, but there have been a number of ideas um, floating around the county about how we can, you um, you know how we can have a uh, a more unified governance model to distribute funding more evenly and uh, and receive funding you know from from the state and then also you know work across jurisdictions so thinking about the you know the san francisco estuaries um adaptation atlas that you know thinks about um you know thinks about climate risks beyond jurisdictional boundaries and that's something that you know traditionally has been very very challenging for you know cities and counties to to collaborate and work together but the climate risks that are that are occurring really require us to work across jurisdictional boundaries um, and something like the you know the one trillion model in San Mateo County would you know we recommend that every county adopts something similar to that um, and it's something that's been talked about in many other counties but um, as far as I know is not a fully built out model um, in Contra Costa just yet. Looks like there's a question here from Deborah. Great work on the playbook. Are there plans to incorporate it with the UC Climate Stewards curriculum? I actually came upon the UC Climate Stewards curriculum two days ago and thought it was an amazing way that we could uh, expand on the playbook and continue topical webinars for folks that are going to do the Climate Stewards curriculum. So it's definitely something that we just found about and are interested in. If you have any information about that, uh, please feel free to email playbook at greenbelt.com org and uh, we can look more into it. We definitely have some bold ideas coming with the webinars on how to make them more course-like so the information builds on itself and builds on the topical areas of the playbook. So stay tuned for that in January. Yeah, definitely. Um, and you know, as Berna mentioned, this is really only the beginning of the playbook. And definitely look out for more webinars, workshops, and one-on-one -on -one meetings. And feel free to reach out to us directly to uh, connect with your organization or the you know elected officials in, in your community. Um, and we you know we really look forward to continuing to launch and really work work with all of you to, to implement this great resource over the next year or so. Greenbelt Alliance, Save the Bay, and Richmond Land are all local nonprofit organizations, and we would not be here without your support. We really appreciate the interest in this webinar. Nearly, I think over 200 people have joined, um, which is truly incredible. It just shows how um, you know, engaged and committed uh, we all are to this work. And we, you know, we look forward to, uh, for you to, to stay tuned about our, our next webinar and our, the next, the future work that we do. And we hope that all of you will uh, utilize this resource and look forward to seeing you next time. So thank you very much for joining everyone.